Welcome to UO Today. I'm Paul Pepys, filling in for Barbara Altman. Our guest today is the groundbreaking journalist Belva Davis. Davis was the first black female TV journalist in the Western U.S. She broke into broadcasting in the mid-60s, a time when stories of importance to African Americans and women rarely made mainstream newscasts. In a career spanning half a century, Davis has covered violent protests, the free speech movement at UC Berkeley, the birth of the Black Panthers, the People's Temple cult that led to mass suicides in Guyana, the assassinations of San Francisco Mayor George Moscone and Supervisor Harvey Milk, the onset of the AIDS epidemic, and the terrorist attacks on the U.S. Embassy in Tanzania that brought Osama bin Laden to the attention of the FBI and the world. Davis has won eight local Emmys and numerous Lifetime Achievement Awards. She's profiled in the Museum, the world's first interactive museum of news. She continues to host a weekly news roundtable and special reports at KQED in San Francisco. Davis gave a talk based on her memoir titled Never in My Wildest Dreams, A Black Woman's Life in Journalism on May 9, 2012. Her lecture was part of the Oregon Humanities Center's year-long conflict series. Belba, thanks for, so much for joining us today. Well, I'm happy to be here. Really, my first trip here. You were born to a teen mother during the Great Depression in rural Louisiana and raised by relatives in the projects of Oakland, California. How did you overcome the circumstances of your childhood to achieve this amazing career? I didn't know I was overcoming. <laughs> ah, nice response. <laughs> I really didn't. I, I, you know, I was born to this, uh, this mom who was a teenager herself, and uh, so she did what, uh, what young moms do. I was given to an older sister. And and the older sister died, and then I lived with many, many people. And so along the way, you learn survival techniques, even as a child. And those survival techniques are generally the same kinds of skills you need to get along in media. Flexibility. <laughs> so can you say a little bit more about how you found your way into a career in journalism? It was a, not an uh, easy path because when I became involved in media, the media was totally segregated. There were no black people writing for white newspapers. There were no black people speaking on radio programs aimed at white people. You only spoke on programs that went to black people. You only wrote for <laughs> papers. And so finally in 1964, the uh, Civil Rights Act of 1964 was signed into law by Lyndon Johnson. A few months later, by then, I was working in a black radio station, and I had a, a, I'd say he was the first intellectual to tolerate my ambition. I had a news director there who was always looking for volunteers. I volunteered. I went to a Republican convention. It was a Goldwater convention. The Dixiecrats were in charge very much in terms of the mood of the day and the division of our people, uh, very reminiscent of what we're going through now. And uh, so we were there covering it, and uh, the second day we were there, we were discovered by a group of angry people after a speech by President Eisenhower, and we were driven from the Cow Palace. And I had learned by then the only people who seemed to count to those who uh, found uh, just my skin color offensive was uh, people in the news media. I watched the Cronkites and the Chandlers of the world uh, put fear into the hearts of these people, but on that night they, they arrested John Chancellor. But in any case, on that same evening, we were driven out of there. And on the way home, I, I said, without portfolio, without a college education, without ever having done anything to my colleague, I'm going to become one of those guys. Mm. <laughs> what challenges have you faced as a black woman in a field dominated for so long by white men? Well, luckily I can say some of the same challenges as my other colleagues. But generally with a little twist, which is why I subtitle my book, A Black Woman's Life in Journalism, mm -hmm. We were at the same events. All of us had to overcome. I just had to work a little harder. And that was the way I looked at it, because it was the way to survive, not to feel so special, but to feel part of the group. And sometimes I lucked out, got the best part of a story. Sometimes I didn't. I suppose that's how it is in journalism. It's definitely that way. You've interviewed countless celebrities and personalities over the years. How did you gain access to these kinds of people as a young reporter? Well, as a journalist, you know, the first thing you have to do is ask. <laughs> 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 and But that's not an easy thing, especially for a short black woman 
who, you know, that doesn't know the ropes, doesn't have a father that's going to make introductions, don't have a cousin that can fix you up with, with whatever, that you have to find ways to get to the person who can possibly say yes. Sometimes that takes longer than it should while you try to gently find out, you know, where you want to go. Um, and so I, I learned the, the technique of um, patience and determination. Once I want, had my eyes on you, except for one guy who I'm working on right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I've had pretty good luck, not always the best luck. It wasn't that I interviewed, say, presidents sitting in the Oval Office or something, but I interviewed them at a level where I was, in a suite in the, you know, the St. Francis Hotel or wherever they were, or with Richard Nixon, you know, standing on a line with him as he reviewed what was to be Palace Guard's uniform and commenting with him as to my opinion about it. That was what I call my interview because we were talking and my camera was rolling. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that, that's, uh, I, I think that's the charm of it, to say how you can be mean and still stand next to a president and have words. <laughs> Is there a particularly memorable interview from your career that you'd like to tell us about? Well, as you, I say it all the time, it's absolutely true. Find me a black journalist of my generation who won't tell you Martin Luther King, Jr. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because he was the hero of the hour, the moment, uh, everything. Can you tell and, us the particular context in which you did the interview? Well, I, I, more than once. I uh -huh. met him when I was working in black radio, because that used to be all that was open to him in his earliest days, at least on a, when he wanted it mm -hmm. to talk, not right. when someone was in trouble. And he used to come into my radio station where I worked as a clerk and was a disc jockey at my own show. But anyway, it, one of his best friends worked at my station, so I would see him coming and going and get the polite hello and all of that. And then I'd see him at the, you know, the usual black church functions. But our first real memorable encounter, w again, wasn't a sit down in the corner. We waited together for hours outside of the Santa Rita prison. I had been given a tip that he was going to come and um, visit with Joan Baez, mm. who was being held at the Alameda County Santa Rita prison. Uh, he came to repay the favor of her visiting him uh, when he was jailed. And uh, the, the ship, as will happen sometimes, law enforcement plays games. All of the people at the gate said nobody had given them the word. They didn't know anything about a King visit, and so on. And we were there so long that my exclusive slipped away. And the next thing we knew, there was a mob of people. But during all that time, there had been moments with Andy Young and him to stand and chat about whatever I could make up to engage them uh, for, for those moments. And, a couple of those engaging moments made it into, uh, made it into a documentary that uh, still floats around and still plays from time to time. And, and you know, you can see this little dark hand, the <laughs> mic in the window, and hear me uh, questioning. And, and fortunately for me, I did ask him at the time when he was changing his philosophy uh, on uh, the role of nonviolence and, and when he was feeling that it had to be much more aggressive, uh, still nonviolent, but their tactics had to be much more uh, vigorous. Mm. And I asked him a question about that that made it into, you know, how we get a news cycle and it's on the network news. <laughs> well, you know you've made it then. <laughs> well, that, that's what happened to uh, one of those little moments of uh, talking. As an interested party, could you tell me what makes a good interview? A good interview is to engage the person enough so that they will tell you their story not your story, <laughs> to get them to relax enough to talk and tell you the story they want as they see it. And it took me a long time to learn that, but I found that when the stories that I liked and felt proud of was when there were um, not intimate moments, but eye-to-eye, -eye, human being-to-human -human being exchanges, not the answers that had been driven in, mm -hmm. you know, and rehearsed, uh, which is hard to get around today. Relatively easy back then because there were only four networks and, and at my station, I mean, here we were number one with ratings were big then, 19. We were, we were as big as the entertainment shows <laughs> and yet we only had uh, five reporters. And uh, 
but you know, we, we, we're, we're a smart station and knew what stories to <laughs> cover with those five people. <laughs> You helped create All Together Now, one of the country's first primetime public affairs programs to focus on ethnic communities. What was important about that show? Silence on the part of too many people. So we came up with this idea that they're not going to give a show to each one of us. They're not going to give a black show, a Hispanic show. So we, w w we somehow got over the ego part of it and decided to come together under this name, All Together Now. And uh, I suggested that the anchor chair uh, rotate with each ethnic group. Well, that didn't quite work out. But what it did happen is I became the anchor introducing very much like uh, the like the Lyra, <laughs> how about that, the news hour now, mm -hmm. uh, where you, you, you do hand off to another person. Mm -hmm. But they get the steadiness of having one person to get the show off the ground and to also uh, know the kinds of stories that are important in all the communities and to try to mix it up and find a common thread. Anyway, it was a wonderful opportunity. We were on on Sunday nights. We used to be the lead-in <laughs> to 60 Minutes. <laughs> it was a joke that still carries on, of course. <laughs> but, um, but we did all of the stories that my friends were telling me they couldn't get past the assignment desk. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it, I still feel good, really good about it today. Mm -hmm. Why did you decide to focus your career on public affairs programming like This Week in Northern California? I think there's some obligation when you cross a barrier to not forget how you got there and to have some responsibility to the people who helped to get you there. No one can get you anywhere that you don't work hard to get there for yourself to understand that first of all. You, otherwise, you sit in the corner pouting, saying what you could have done. But I felt a real obligation during those times when we were just changing the societies in ways that we thought we'd solved or certainly were on the way to solving the questions around race. And we didn't know that we were just opening the door but then it, there were, the sky was absolutely the limit because we could say where we wanted to send the camera. We could say who we wanted to interview. We could stack the show any way that we want to. And uh, I mean, I don't know anybody could do that today. <laughs> but it, uh, and they sort of turned it over, you know, to the staff of, of all of us minorities. And amazingly enough, we, we managed to get along. And some of us uh, still, Isabel Duran, a friend of mine who's on the air, Channel 4 right now today, and a number of others who are still in the business all these years later. What advice do you offer to aspiring young journalists? You know, I don't know if I'm the qualified person to offer advice. My world was so different mm. uh, in terms of the technology of the, of the work, in terms of what was expected from me. Uh, because we had a 30-minute show. Mm -hmm. Now we have a 24-hour day, you know, continuing moving bits and pieces of infomercials and so on, going on and on. So how do you get your head around that? I could go in like uh, feeling like a missionary, mm -hmm. <laughs> so to speak, because I'm going to tell them all about, you know, what people of color really think about this, or I'm going to invite somebody in who know just what and how on earth are the are the middle class Hispanics dealing with the farm worker movement? Do they, do they see themselves in that group? Why don't the Asians want to be part of the 209 battle? You know, those kinds of issues. Who's going to do that <laughs> if we people who've made it in don't remind others that those are stories that we ought to think about? So what do you do today when the time limits are so short, mm -hmm. when the focus is so transitory? I, I always tell people, you keep your eyes and your ears open. You try to look where you're going. But before you go out into the storm, make some arrangements in here as to how much you want to do, how much you want this job, what you're willing to give up for, you know, where are your morals, uh, the line that says, no, not that. Mm -hmm. um, I think the thing that, that pains me a little bit, I came along when, you know, I, and I call myself a feminist, because that's what I had to be, uh, just by being there. But where we fought so hard to say, 
you know, respect, have them respect you for your brains, you know, not from the length of your skirt, and all of those things. And now to, you know, go into some markets and see people sitting on sets with many skirts as short as they can get, or blouse. I mean, it's a crazy thing for me to be talking about that, but coming from my background, that's what I'm going to say, where we were fighting hard to, uh, to make those kinds of pre prerequisites not part of why you get a job. Mm -hmm. it, it's interesting to see that it's reversed itself mm -hmm. and that um, the young women coming in uh, can find that they can live with it. Have you gotten to a place professionally where you no longer feel you have to prove yourself? No way. <laughs> you know, I, I, I tell a story in the book which uh, sort of set the stage for how I've looked on life maybe 40 some years later, but but I was once fortunate enough to be the chosen one at a Frank Sinatra concert. And remember, I'm the woman there because there are no women reporters. I'm there with a bunch of white guys who know they have the inside track and mm -hmm. are wondering why I'm hanging out. And on this particular night, after his performance, where we all waited to hope to get a word with Frank Sinatra, uh, he came to his uh, trailer room door and uh, did a magical thing and said, hey, girly. <laughs> hey, girly got me into the room. Hey, girly caused me to tremble and almost go in, into tears knowing that I'm sitting across from the great Frank Sinatra. And that was when he taught me a lesson for life. And that was when he took my hand and said to me, there's no shame. I don't think I have the words right. There's, he didn't say shame. There's nothing wrong, that was it, with being nervous. And he said to me, the day I go out on a stage and I don't feel nervous is the day I quit. Mm -hmm. And I don't know whether he meant it or he got us through the moment, but boy, I can tell you that record played over and over in my head every time I went someplace and didn't know if I was gonna hold it together. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's a great story. <laughs> Your memoir is titled, Never in My Wildest Dreams. What does that title mean to you? My life is that. <laughs> <laughs> you're talking to a southern born you know child of a teenager uh, living in homes all over didn't get a college degree uh, whose the expectation was that I could come I could become a good clerk typist if I was lucky and uh, who then found herself in this world that seemed uh, almost unreal and I oft times would do things and they didn't seem real and that's why doing the book became so important because I had to go back and you know and, and that's why I made it a memoir and not an autobiography because I wanted to tell the stories as I experienced them and as I remembered them and uh, it was it saved me a lot of money because I didn't have to go through therapy mm. I just <laughs> had to go through my life <laughs> <laughs> with a good editor, and uh, you know, th there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Will you say a little bit more about what it was like writing the memoir? It was a struggle. I mean, I was always a saver because once I realized that I had, you know, by grace, been put into a unique position and, uh, and accepted the responsibility that went with that, I started saving little bits of this and little bits of that. And uh, I knew that at one time, somewhere in life, I was going to want to, um, I was going to want to write it down, if for no other reason than for my children or my grandchildren, uh, that they needed to know what it was like to get. And they, they didn't, I didn't want them to, as so many kids today think, you know, I just woke up one morning and there I was before the camera. So that really was the motivation. And it was only as, uh, you know, the years went by and life started to change. And the thing called the one-man ban in news gathering started where a reporter takes the picture, you know, edits the tape, mm -hmm. uh, appear on camera, writes the lead-in, does the whole thing. Well, it's great that you can have that capability, but you cannot in one afternoon in a few short hours make the best job you can out of covering that story. And I knew the business was changing. Reporters coming after me, unless they were very fortunate, would not have the opportunity to 
operate at the pace where I did. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted him to know about that. If you get the opportunity to interview President Obama and Governor Romney during this election cycle, what would you want to ask or discuss with them? Well, you know, it sounds like an innocent question, and I guess, and I have to tell you that it's my most recent driving thing going right now. And that is, um, why haven't you encouraged more people to become involved and become civically engaged? Why haven't you said, unless you do, and unless you get an education so that you can understand what is being said and done to and for you, then you're not in love with your country. And I, I would love to see a president challenge us to love democracy enough to save ourselves. Can you, is, behind that question is an implication that um, in some ways, things are not as good in, in public discourse as they once were. Would you say a little bit more about that? Well, because, I mean, I go out to dinner and you see it, 10 people sitting around a table and everybody's got their, <laughs> their smartphone out. They're not talking to one another unless they're doing it by messaging each other. And if they are, that would really be sad that they would sit across from one another and, and not think enough of the other person to you know, give them a few breaths <laughs> of speech. So, uh, no, it, it's, it, it's not just that people aren't talking to each other. They don't seem really interested other than in superficial ways, you know, on Facebook or some other cleansing of human emotion <laughs> transmissions <laughs> um, to, to want to talk to one another not face to face. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I've heard so many people say, you know, I, I just don't. But of course I have to give it the good part. It has allowed a number of people that I know mm. to find mates, to find love. So there's something good about it. <laughs> but maybe in talking politics and, you know, who did what to whom uh, in, in the political world is, uh, it certainly has been short circuited mm -hmm. because we're all now almost labeled immediately by what side we're on and mm -hmm. what station we listen to tells you more than you want to tell people about what you really think. You'll be retiring immediately after the 2012 presidential election. What are your plans for your retirement? It's just like the rest of my life. It's evolving. <laughs> it truly is and things are happening. I'm at, uh, writing this book. I didn't know it was going to become a, you know, a, a almost the main driver in my life because I look at the book as an opportunity to communicate with people, young people, and to talk with them about excuses and to let them know that uh, their responsibilities are grave because the world is a more dangerous place. Therefore, they've got to work a little bit harder. And then I give the examples of how I worked hard mm -hmm. and how I worked hard, not because I was wonderful or great or smart or anything else, but I developed you know, this hunger for it. And I want to see if I can plant a few seeds that will grow a little more passion about life and responsibility. And if a book will allow me to do that, and uh, I'm working very hard to get to you know, particularly community college level where people are still not sure about what they want to do and it's easy to find some stick and hold on to it instead of standing up. Uh, and, 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 I, and it's harder for them, I know that. I don't go and tell anybody. I had a whole community standing behind me because mm -hmm. people wanted me to succeed so they were there to, you know, to make sure that I, w I, I was treated well and it's much harder for people today to have that sense that a community is going to step forward and protect you when you get in trouble or push real hard for certain kind of coverage. What hopes do you have for your grandchildren? Oh my goodness gracious. Such high hopes because, you know, I mean, if, if I've had all these miracles, I'm out here with this book now and I'm going to keep talking till I, met, till I meet the other people who are doing the real work and I'm going <laughs> to hang on to them refer people to them, somebody's going to get it, 
And because uh, I, I, I just think this is a country of winners, we just have forgot how to get on the right track is so that we end up in the lane that is going to take us to the goalpost. And you're hoping that your, your, your grandchildren will be on that lane. I am, definitely. <laughs> I definitely am. Um, my last question is, um, is there anything that you think about where um, the society has changed for the good that you'd like to leave us with as your last comment in the t in, during your career? Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I have to say that if we could have the miracle of a Barack Obama election. We haven't behaved very well since then, but there was a moment when we managed to forget a lot of animosity, a lot of history, a lot of cultural biases, which proves again, you know, I, 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 my friends used to laugh at me, you know, they said, when are you going to wear your American flag then? <laughs> but I realized that without, you know, the rule of law that was in this country to, to set people free of, of my race, uh, that's a miracle of America, number one, in recognizing the wrongness of that, and then to try to move forward, even though, you know, the drumbeat of those who would uh, deny equality to all still is very loud. Uh, I'm pleased and hopeful that there's still the opportunity for discourse and disagreement without violence. Thank you so much for speaking <laughs> with us today. Thank you. We've been speaking with the groundbreaking journalist Belva Davis, whose career has spanned half a century. She was the first black female TV journalist in the Western United States. Davis gave a talk based on her memoir titled Never in My Wildest Dreams, A Black Woman's Life in Journalism on May 9, 2012. Her lecture was part of the Oregon Humanities Center's year-long conflict series. Thanks very much for watching. <laughs>